By 1649, the civil war was officially over. King Charles I had been beheaded, and England made its first experiment as a republic. The Member of Parliament for Huntingdon, Oliver Cromwell, had become Lieutenant General Cromwell of the new model army. Word, sir. I've been looking for Fairfax for an hour, Trooper, and I've had more to concern me than the password. I'm sorry, sir. My orders are... I am I... Major Francis White, and I hold His Excellency's special commission. All right, Trooper. Let the Major pass. I'll take responsibility. I must see the Lord General. There's a council of war, sir, and my orders are to let no one pass except messengers from the action. For the 20th time tonight, Trooper, I am Major Francis White, and I bear His Excellency's special commission. Is the collarbone broken? I don't think so, sir. Bullet's embedded and I can't get at it. It looked as though about half of them have escaped, Lord General, mostly on foot. They have their horses safe and a good deal of baggage. They won't get far on foot. Let the loyal troopers have choices, boys, boys and weapons. Lord General Fairfax! Lord General, I must speak with you. Harmony Major White, I'm glad to see you safe. I have the agitator's letter for you, my lord, and I've been looking for you these two hours. I've been near pistol two or three times and then arrested by half a dozen of your excellency's own troopers. Army, Major White. You have betrayed us, sir. You have betrayed the soldiers. Betrayed me and betrayed yourself. Moderate yourself, sir. Remember where you are and to whom you are speaking. I know you, sir. I know all these gentlemen. And I know that God sees into our hearts. He does, sir, and we thank his mercy for it. I'd be glad to have a few words with you, sir, before you speak any further in this vein. I am in the street in my slippers, General Cromwell, to prevent bloodshed. It does you credit, Major White, and God has approved your actions, both yours and ours, in taking only two lives for this night's work. If your excellency will excuse us, I will acquaint Major White of the true situation. Willingly, gentlemen. This way, Major White, please. Into the next room. Quick. There's news of the prisoners, Lord General. How many take me? More than 300. Where are they? Houston is putting them all in the church. Which is where on this map? John Cantlow, Captain Hutchinson's troop. Commissary, General Ireton's regiment. Next. John Watkinson, Colonel Scroop's regiment. His own troop. Next. You have no right to demand my name and I refuse to give it. Oh, yes. I know him. Mal Syndicton, quartermaster to Colonel Scroop. Move! Next. Who are these men? They're not royalists. They were beaten long ago. These are the elite of the victorious Puritans, cavalry troopers of the new model army, the crack fighting force that won the English Civil War and never lost a battle. Their enemies call them levellers, a name they dislike. The pamphlet called The Agreement of the People contains their manifesto for a reborn England, an England of free voting citizens bound by law. For that, they were prepared to mutiny. And now, for the first time in many years, they know what it's like to be losers. Next. John Roper, General Ireton's regiment. Thomas Perkins, Corporal, Colonel Scroop's regiment. You! Pat 
Take those ribbons from your hat. An Englishman has the right to wear sea green ribbons in his hat if he chooses Colonel Hewson. I never heard any law against that. My word is the law as far as you're concerned. What's your name? John Church. John Church. On! His Excellency's words were quite clear, sir. He told me to tell the mutineers that they need fear no attack while negotiations were in progress. And at midnight you fell upon them in their beds. Men were marching to join the mutineers from Colonel Harrison's regiment at Gloucester, contrary to the terms of the negotiations. That was never said, sir. I gave them my word and they trusted me. There weren't even any guards posted. <laughs> Soldiers should never sleep without guards, Major White. You know that. I have sought the Lord with great urgency this morning, sir. And in my conscience, he tells me we have betrayed these men. Major White. The cause of God's people is in great danger at this time. There are more levelers in the army than these who have drawn their swords. Some of the very men who surprised and captured them this morning have copies of the agreement of the people in their knapsacks. In what we will have to act this day, I beseech you to seek God even more diligently than you have done. His voice has spoken clearly and unequivocally, but I fear you haven't heard it. But, sir, in plain words, Major White, you must keep your mouth shut till the light of God's providence becomes clearer to you. Oh, where did you get that? Two things a soldier must never be parted from, his rations and his pistol. Hey, shh, shh, how did you manage? Never mind how. I kept both pistols loaded by my pillow. And so did I, but I shot them off since I attacked Always us. Always keep one bullet in reserve, Tom. You never know when you might need it. What will they do to us? What they did to Robert Lockyer, if we let them. They shot him to death in St Paul's churchyard, only for asking for his back pay. Black Tom will never shoot his own soldiers. But Oliver might. Fairfax will do what Cromwell and Harrison tell him to do, like he did at the King's execution. Whatever happens, no one's going to ask our opinion. Agitators meeting behind the pulpit. Agitators meeting behind the pulpit. Where? The pulpit. I'll tell Miles. The guards looking. They can't see the thing from here, not from either door. What is it? Agents meeting. A bit late now. Any oh, yeah. news? It's time we had a meeting. What's the point of a meeting? It should be their prayers. We ought to confer. Confer? We're prisoners here. There's 2,000 horses in the town and half the high command with them. There's nothing to confer about. To begin with, how many of us are captured? 314 here, four wounded. Which means nearly 800 of us are still free. Then there are the men from Harrison's regiment at Gloucester. They're not certain. They should have been at a rendezvous yesterday. They weren't. Don't forget my brother and his men. They'll soon be here to help mm. us. Your brother was beaten at Banbury where one of his men joined up our troop. Said they ran like rabbits. I heard late last night that my brother has at least 50 men with him. They take a Northampton, men. and there's an army, 10,000 strong, marching from London to join us. Oliver is finished. All we Shh, have to listen to me. Why, we're prisoners in this church. Too much wild talk, not enough deciding. Or we must make a plan to break out. Talk sense, boy. Colonel Ayres was captured, but they've not put him in here with us, so we must elect new officers. Yeah, we won't see Ayres again. They'll shoot him. They don't shoot gentlemen. It's only troopers they shoot. They don't dare to shoot us. The whole army is with well, us. Where is it, then? Who attacked us last night? Who'd they find to do it? Well, they found six men to shoot Lockyer soon enough. From his own regiment. They'll do just what they like with this. Why don't you understand that, all of you? We're beaten. All we can do now is to throw ourselves on Fairfax's mercy. Now, there's one thing we must do. We must stick together. Man for man, we are beaten. But as a group with elected representatives, we could still negotiate terms. No negotiations. There'll be court martials and sentences and bullets. The only question is who for? Listen, we're one missing. Where's Henry Den? Was he captured? Yes, he was with me. There he is. I'll get him. 
I spoke to him last night. He was full of the spirit of the Lord. I hope he still is. We'll need him. Miles Syndicum won't come. Why not? He says it's a waste of time. There's an agitator's meeting, Cornet Den. I have sought the Lord, Cornet Thompson, for six hours together. The Lord is with us in all good designs. But the light of his countenance is hidden from me. I see only darkness. Gentlemen, I hope you have all sought the Lord most earnestly this morning to employ his guidance in the work we must do today. Amen. 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 I have thought it fit that this council should consist of senior officers only, the problem before us being the discipline of the army, but the special circumstances of his mission and of yesterday's events led me to ask Major White to join us. Major White is most welcome. His voice will be heard. Gentlemen, Ayres is already sent to Oxford under guard for civilian trials. We are now to consider the case of 340 of our fellow soldiers in a state of mutiny. Let me hear your opinions. Colonel Hewson. Penalty for mutiny is death. Shoot them. Let the army see the days when we took our orders from the ranks are over. Colonel Oakey. By martial law, the penalty is death. Colonel Scroop. They are my own soldiers, Lord General. And some of them I know as well as I know you or any of us. But there will be no peace in this army till some example is made. Colonel Harrison. We are about a great business. Those that hinder the Lord's work are the agents of Antichrist. It must be death. Major White. With your forgiveness, Lord General, it is no part of my duty to sit in judgment. No, sir. The Lord has laid that burden upon us. Lieutenant General. By martial law, the penalty must be death. Thank you, gentlemen. However, we all know, I think, the matter is not as simple as that. Nor while I am in command of this army will I allow my men to be shot. If there is any way in which their lives can be saved. With respect, Lord General. Colonel Oki's shoulder is shot through and two men are dead. We all know the power the levelers have in this land. Tens of thousands signed their petitions. And 20,000 mourners followed Robert Lockyer to his grave till the streets of London were awash with sea green ribbons. Mercy, which is the smile of Christ upon the just, is misplaced at this time. They are all equally guilty. Let them all be shot, General or at Houston. least decimated, so the troopers of other regiments will see what rebellion will cost them. General Houston, I have made it clear I will not allow indiscriminate slaughter. But, Lord General, something must be done. They are my own men. When I tried to reason with them yesterday and return them to their obedience, they cheered me from the camp. For Christ loved Judas yes, and yes, died yes. for him. Yes, yes. Christ loved Cain. Yes. For their bodies to be bruised, nor their souls to be coerced. Because God is in all things and in all people to the very ends of the earth, and all, all shall be saved. It's great sacrifice. Sin is dead. The dungeons of hell are empty. The prisoners are all. Fled up into the light, for every man and every man's thought is holy. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth are one and the same kingdom. Every man's voice shall be heard, every man's rights shall be respected. For his voice is the voice of God, his rights are born in him of God. Manifest himself to us in our many great victories for his cause. Has he not been strong for us in the field and in all our actions for his word? What greater proof do we need that we walk in his ways? Not the Lord with us, 
Ghost last night, or was he with Cromwell and his troopers? The Lord will not suffer his foot to be moved. Well, he deserted us last night, that's for sure. The Lord has delivered us into the hands of our enemies. When we fought with Oliver and Fairfax and Harrison, when were we ever defeated? Only now, in turning our hand against them, the Lord has spoken for the army and against us. Do not deceive his chosen ones, his children. Paper here. It's called the agreement of the people. England's freedom, soldiers' rights. I've worn it in my hat with the rest of us and been prepared to die for the freedoms it promises us. But now I spurn it. I cast it from me. The Lord has spoken against it. And I have not of it. Listen to me, comrades. Have we learned nothing in all the battles we've won and the dangers we've endured? Have we seen cavaliers and great gentlemen running from us like babies? And our own friends shot down at our sides, and are we still children? I'll tell you what we've learned, comrades. We've learned that kings and tyrants are mortal creatures, and when you cut their heads off, their rule is ended. We have learned that there is no divine law that says some men should be rich and give good meat to their dogs while other men starve at their gates. The Lord has spoken! He'll have none of it! Two comrades, since I became a trooper in the Lord's army and my education began, I have learned that God does not reach visible fingers into human affairs. In spite of what Oliver may tell you about God's arm being with him in this or that fight, I've learned, comrades, that the things of the earth are subject to the wills of men. <laughs> and that the men who triumph are not necessarily the best or the most holy, but those who have the most power in their hands. <laughs> Beaten. Yes, we were. But that was our fault, our own gullibility and unpreparedness. There is another day tomorrow, and if we are all God's children and there is no sin, as Henry Den tells us, and brothers, I'm sure of it, yes, then our voices must be heard. Oh, Just the same as the voices of those great gentlemen and landowners who command the army. Oh, Comrades, you all know me. I am John Church. I was a master carpenter in Southwark before this war began. And I can carve a table and fashion a door as well as any man. But because my hands are wood hardened and I can use a chisel, does that mean I must have no voice in the settlement of this nation? The names of the agitators. Whatever happens, we must have them. I can be sure of two of them. Cornet James Thompson, the younger brother of the renegade Thompson, and Cornet Den, the preacher. I've heard of Den before. Man's an absolute Anabaptist, and preaches blasphemies too horrible to name. Among the troopers, there are many others who will preach or speak as the spirit moves. Major them. White, you've spoken to these men more recently than any of us. With respect, Lord General, I would entreat you not to ask me to tell you their names. With respect, Major, I'm asking you exactly that. You hold my special commission for that purpose. To negotiate, sir, not to betray. There is only one betrayal in question here, sir. These soldiers who have betrayed their duty, and you who betray your commission with all this shuffling. You're deliberately misrepresenting me, Colonel. Either that or you're a fool. Gentlemen, I want what this man in this room who does not know what my mission was. The offers that were made and the answers that were given. In your Excellency's letter to the agitators, which I bore, you said you were willing to negotiate with them over all their grievances, including the calling of a full council of the army with the men represented, their refusal to go to Ireland, and a settlement of the nation according to the agreement of the people. I rode away from your camp, Lord General, with your promises ringing in my ears, and yours too, Lieutenant General, that no action would be taken until you had seen their answer. I swore it to them, sir. I said I would place my own body between them and your bullets if we betrayed them. So certain was I of your faith. The men broke the terms of the truce by marching from Wantage to rendezvous with Colonel Harrison's men at Abington. Would we expect us to stand still and watch them while they collected an army from all corners of the kingdom? That was no more than an excuse to destroy them, Lieutenant General. We all know it in our hearts. Our names will stink for it in the nose of history. Major White, I think you would be wise to sit down and collect yourself before you say any more. Two years ago, at Berry and Saffron Walden, this man was famous for his support of the agitators. He was one of their leaders in that business. Why else would the levelers negotiate with him at all if he weren't one of them? 
This man is a spy in our midst. That is a lie, sir, and you know it. We expelled him from the council at Putney because of the violence of his language and the immoderation of his Gentlemen, view. I shall dissolve this meeting if his unseemly brawl continues. You've not dealt justly with me, either now or in the past. Ever since the council at Putney, why was I passed over for the lieutenant colonelship of my regiment when it was mine by normal progression? What, Major White? Is it simply ambition that moves you so strongly? I thought you were talking of sincerity and betrayal. Weightier matters, surely, than your promotion. I've spoken no more than the truth about him. He's not to be trusted. I believe he is, Colonel Hewson. It is true he has been the level his friend, but so have we all, in varying degrees, until their irresponsibility forced us to break with them. And with regard to this question of betrayal, I think he will come to see that we've acted honorably, and indeed with great tenderness of heart when dealing with mutiny. Gentlemen, I don't know what to say. My honesty has been questioned, my loyalty and my trust. And in my own judgment, I have never given cause for it, following only the truth as I see it. I've never doubted that, sir. Your honesty and plain speaking have been an example to us today. And when you come to give an account of your part in this business, I'm sure you will make an honest man's attempt to make it quite clear what has really happened here. I know what happened, Lieutenant General, so do you. And all of us. It is a question of trust, isn't it, Major? Colonel Hewson's right. Your part has been a doubtful one, and we've not honestly felt that we could trust you with a promotion you undoubtedly deserve. It's time now for you to let us know where you stand. Whose side you're on in this business? I am on the side of truth, Lieutenant General, and integrity. No, sir, you do not understand. You may put your commission on this table and leave the army today. You may even join your friends in the church, if you wish. I think, Lord General, I don't speak about myself. Go on, sir. Or you may stay here and join in our deliberations. The choice is yours. No man is forced to be an officer in this army. There's the door. Outside it, you may do and say what you please, short of treason. Inside it, you must consider your words with some care. With your permission, gentlemen, my wish is to remain with the council. I'm glad to hear it, sir. We have need of men of integrity. Perhaps you would like to bring this meeting back to a more sober contemplation by giving us the names of the agitators you spoke with. Dan, Perkins, Syndicum, Thompson, Church. They are the principal men. John Lilburn has said, what is done to anyone may be done to everyone. It's not just us, you see, here in this church. There are hundreds and thousands of us who will watch what we do here and what is done to us because they know that their lives and liberty are at stake as well as ours. John has said too, I have always carried my life in my hands, ready to lay it down at 15 minutes notice for this cause. Who's talking of laying down lives? We have a cause to live for, not to die for. We have had an agitators meeting and we've come to this conclusion. What about these fellows? You haven't asked them what they think. Oh, we're their elected agents, Miles Syndicum, same as you were. That was before. We're all the same now. We're all prisoners and that changes everything. If you want to elect new agitators, then we'll come down and... Oh, so you answered? Do what you like. It's every man for himself now. No, no, that's a certain way to defeat. If we stand together, we still have some strength left. You do as you please, John Church. You've always liked calling meetings and taking votes. But I shall put a few bullets in a few heads before I'm done. And we'll see then who will have the greater effect. You talk like a baby, boy. Prisoner of common madhouse. Compose yourselves. Get ready to say your prayers. Colonel Harrison, Colonel Stroop, and Colonel O'Keefe bring you news from His Excellency's Council. Shame on you. 
Shame upon your tents, O Israel, you that have fallen from the service of the Lord. What can we bring you but tears and lamentation at your great iniquity? The penalty for mutiny is death. There is no other laid down in the rules of war. You are all equally guilty, and it is impossible to divide the blame. The offense being heinous, you are all sentenced to death by shooting. Jesus. His Excellency, in the bowels of his compassion, and not wishing to spend more blood than be needful, has commuted the sentence to one of decimation. One man in every ten will be shot, to be decided by the drawing of straws. Cornet Dane, Cornet Thompson, Quartermaster Syndicum, will attend a special court martial in His Excellency's lodging. Hop up! Don't forget, brothers, we will all stand together. Help me now in this my hour of time. Christ have mercy on you. next end job we know Tom we must be ready for them are ah, you one of the agitators in Colonel Scroop's regiment I thought the Star Chamber was abolished and that the Inquisition was for Spanish papists not for English answer the Lord General I like to nothing to incriminate myself you're here under threat of death you can take my life if you please but it'll be innocent blood on your head it'll be court martial under all there is no war the war is over we are English soldiers asking for our rights that is for us to judge are you judge jury and prosecutor then that is tyranny not law show me the charge on paper let me have counsel take them away Lord General Wasting our time. Oh, yes, your time is coming. We'll hear it of you soon enough. An army is coming from London to help us. My brother will come with his men to destroy you. There is no you. army from London, Corley Thompson. Your brother's forces are dispersed. He himself has fled for his life. In a few days, he will be dead. I don't believe you. You may believe what you like, Take sir. Take him away. I don't believe you. My brother is coming. I know he is. Who is next? I have spoken only the word of Christ, as he has revealed it to my heart. I have spoken horrible blasphemies in my own hearing, that there is no sin, nor any hell for the wicked, and that all men are saved. Is it not written that some shall be taken and some shall be left? Does Christ tell you to incite soldiers to mutiny and rebellion? He told me it was lawful to rebel against a wicked king. He tells me that all men are his children, and that the common trooper hath a right to be heard in council as well as the officer. And has God owned all your preachings? As he marched with you in your hour of trial, as he always marches with the just. Oh. Uh. The Lord has always spoken to me. I am his vessel. Our God is a jealous God, Cornet Den, in the defense of his truth. He visits pestilence and destruction upon a nation that departs from his way. I find it nowhere in the scripture that papists, atheists, and Jews shall be saved, but only his chosen people, his elect, who are saved not of themselves, but by grace, before creation and after judgment everlastingly. Whereas you, Cornet Den, you sit there, our prisoner, and under the hand of his anger. The Lord does not deserve children. He's always spoken to me. If I may make a suggestion, Lord General. Do not return Cornet Den to the church with the others. He's a man of great spiritual insight. Let him be shut up alone in a silent place with the word of God. He's in need of comfort and must diligently seek the Lord. I am his vessel. I am the mouth of his word. The Lieutenant General is great in his mercy, Cornet Den. You will be safe in his hands. You have been a turbulent soldier, Quartermaster Syndicum. 
Wherever we've had dissension in the army, remonstrances, petitions and the like, we've found your footsteps. But I'm changed now, sir. I'm not the same man. How are you changed? The company you keep suggests otherwise. I am finished with petitions. A bullet or two in the right place will suffice. Do you threaten us to our faces, sir? Those that destroy the liberty we fought for shall be themselves destroyed. You are speaking treason, sir, ten times over. I know, gentlemen, that is my intention. What will you do with me? When am I to die? To think we are Turks, sir, to slaughter a man for boasting. If you show mercy, I will return no gratitude. You have stolen our commons with your hedges and our freedom with your swords. And that cannot be forgiven. Take him away. I've seen your life before, Quartermaster, when the charge comes to the first to run. Oh, not me, sir! I shall stand firm! You have my promise! What shall we do with them? Syndicum is a windbag. Cashier him and forget him. And the others? Shoot them! What we need is to find one of their own men to repudiate them. There's a small chance of that. Most of them are our own veterans. If they've learned nothing else, they've learned how to die for a cause. If the cause is just. But if they come to believe the cause is not just... Well... Shall we dine now, Lord General? We'll leave the other two men till tomorrow. By all means, by all means, gentlemen. Have you no more profitable way to spend your time, Anthony Sedley? No, John Kent, no, I haven't. I may have a bullet in my heart tomorrow. We have followed the wrong path, and the Lord has stricken us for it. They asked too much of us. We have no power but our naked hands and what we can suffer. Some of us will die if we have to, but most of us want peace. Isn't that so? God be with you, Anthony Sedley. Feet hurt. I'm not an Indian or a savage to run barefoot. I need to be well shod. Keep remembering an evening in London. One of your lewd tales, John Bishop. What happened? Little group of us. Four or five troopers standing in the street together, talking and laughing. And suddenly a pot of wine was thrown over us from upstairs. You were lucky it was only wine. <laughs> I looked up. And there's this lordly fella standing there, with his lace collar and his slashed sleeves. And he said, be quiet below, you scum. Can't a fella have a drink in peace? What did you do? We just looked at each other. And quite spontaneously, we went upstairs together. And we gave that fella the hiding of his life with the compliments of the army. I can just see it, too. You always were a mad jack. I thought then, we beat them at Naseby. They can't insult us like dogs anymore. He may be a peer of the realm and I may be John Bishop, a weaver and a weaver's son. But we're both men. We must earn our respect. Well, John, <clears throat> my feet told me those days are over. You try giving Oliver or Black Tom a hiding, see what you get. Half a dozen bullets. The Lieutenant General sent me to your corned den to help you in your seeking. I am wrestling with the Lord. And the Prince of Darkness. He is here too. He is ready for us, sir, if we miss the right way. But I am the Lord's advocate, and I will speak for you. I have hidden nothing from the Lord. Whatever he has spoken, I have performed it, whatever the danger or price. 
Why has he deserted me in my hour of anguish? He is here, Henry Den. He is omnipresent, and he never deserts his people. Perhaps you have deserted him. Your treason is apparent, Corporal Perkins. I've committed no treason. I lived under oppression, and when I saw a chance to fight against it, I fought. What oppression are you under now, riding with the greatest army of liberation since Christ entered Jerusalem? Sir, you've known me for five years. Can you answer me a simple question? What is it? Before, we was ruled by a king, lords and commons. Now we're ruled by a Lord General, a Council of State and Commons. And for a man like me, where's the difference in that? I looked up from the scriptures, for I was complete in the word of God. And my eyes were opened. I saw poverty such that my soul cried out in anguish. And in London, God's people, Presbyterians and independents alike, dress themselves in silk and furs and spend more on holy books than the poor man hath for bread. But I am a Christian. I know this cannot be right. I have acted according to his word, but the face of the Lord hath not smiled upon me. You speak like a man of Christ, Henry Den, but you mistake your time. Is it not written in the book of Revelation that the tyrant shall be thrown down and the saints shall rule? We shall not die, brother, you and I, if we keep faith, but live to see the thousand-year kingdom of our Saviour on earth. Will not King Jesus wipe away all the tears of the oppressed with his own hands? Amen, amen. Will he not stoop to the suffering and lift them up and make them his people? Amen, amen. Will not all hunger be ended in the great spiritual feasting of his love? Amen, dear Christ, amen. Do our questions so much disturb you that you can think of no answer but to shoot us? It is my wish to be merciful, but I have shot my own soldiers before now for looting and indiscipline, and I shall do it again if I have to. Whose goods have we stolen? What men have we abused? We ask only for our rights as Englishmen. You ask more than we can give, you know that. We ask for the performance of your promise. By the engagement of June the 5th, 1647, you promised to us that you would be advised by a full council of the army, with the troopers represented, so that the men's voices should be heard with those of the officers. For six months, your promises were kept, and we were one army united. But we've been summoned to no council for over a year now. I am commander of this army, sir, and I will command it. When I need your advice, I will ask for it. You treat us like mercenaries, sir. We are not that. We are free-born Englishmen, men of conscience, who chose to fight in this army to buy our freedom with our blood, if need be. Now you tell us to go and fight against the Irish, who know no better than to be papists. We have no quarrel with the free people of Ireland. What right have we to march upon them and kill them? We have no right, sir. And being men of conscience, we will not do it. We will not kill men merely at your orders or to gratify your whim. If we would, we were merely butchers, not honest men. And we will satisfy our own freedom before we march against anyone. What do you call freedom, Corporal? Is it license for every man to do as he pleases? No, sir. It is the agreement of the free people of England. It is a vote for every free man. And freedom of conscience for Catholic, Christian, atheist or Jew. Without it, you are mere tyrants ruling by the sword. We want none of John Lilburn's pamphlets here. It is the civil and military sword in different hands, so that you will have no right to try me for my life simply because I've offended you. And I'll tell you what else it is, too, sir. It's a licentious and blasphemous anarchy. A levelling communism, so that no man may call his property his own. If all men may vote, why shouldn't the landless multitudes vote themselves in to be masters of my estates? Enjoy my revenues and leave me a beggar at the gate! We fought so that our properties would be made safe. Not to throw every man's rights into jeopardy. You said it, sir. Not me. What do you mean by that? You may have fought for that, Lord General. But in that case, what did we fight for? The right to be your slaves. We all fought together, Corporal. To bring down the bishops and bridle the king. Now we fell into these disagreements only after victory was won. 
You are a merciful and honest man, Lord General. Every man in the army knows that. But I tell you before God, you'll shoot us down as quickly as any of these when our freedom threatens the lands you had from your father. They are mine by right, Corporal. Yes, sir. And the Lieutenant Generals, too. And Colonel Scroops. Colonel Hewson used to be a bootmaker. Colonel Oakey sold rope. But now they've risen in the world, and they're master of estates, too. And there's the difference between us. But I never heard it said that some men are born into the world with saddles on their backs, and others booted and spurred to ride them. I've lived in that belief, and I'll die in it if I have to. Beloved Father, merciful Christ, who has raised me from the darkness up into salvation and light. Give thanks to him, Cornet Den, that he's opened your eyes to salvation. I say it must be death. To flinch now will be fatal. Death. 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 Lord General. Let it be death, if it must be. What about Den? Leave him to me. His Excellency, the Lord General, Sir Thomas Fairfax, Commander-in-Chief of the new model army of the Commonwealth and Parliament of England. Tomorrow morning, at the hour of eight o'clock, outside the west door, the following men will be shot to death for mutiny. Cornet James Thompson. No. No. Cornet Henry Den. Blessed is the name of the Lord's mercy, is for sure. Blessed is the name of the Lord's mercy. Is for... Corporal Thomas Perkins. Corporal John Church. All other prisoners will be paraded to witness the deaths of these men. And may Christ have mercy on them and on all of us who love him. I did not think that carnal ambition had been so powerful in you, Major White. Don't misjudge me, sir. I have my share like any man. But other questions, too, more difficult to answer. What questions? What ought to be done and what can be done. Sometimes it is easier to die than to live. Their blood is on my hands, I know that. But you cannot make a revolution in the States without taking responsibility for many things, which is an honest private man you would abhor. If we fail, all that we fought for for seven years will be destroyed. And our last state will be worse than the first. I must prevent that. Any guilt that I incur, my shoulders must learn to bear it. Ready? Mm. Are you really going? They don't mean to leave me out. Oh, I know Cromwell. If I stay, they'll shoot me with the others. They're going to shoot you anyway if you're trying to yeah, get out. We'll see. And don't forget your part. Right. Will they really shoot us, John? I think they will. You'd better prepare yourself. I can't believe they mean to do it. Perhaps they want to intimidate us so that we plead for mercy in front of the others. They want us dead, James. No, have mercy on me! All right, just 
Not a word, Trooper. There's a bullet through your head. Now, I'm going through that door. I shall be just behind it. And one word and you die. about. Nervous, I suppose, about tomorrow. All well here, Trooper? Yes, sir. All well here. Dear Jesus, sweet Jesus, Receive my soul. They're going to my do it. They're really going to do it. Face up to it, James. Don't let them see you tremble. A man's life isn't over till he's dead. Remember that. There's still one thing we can say and do well, so that no one will be in any doubt what they're doing to us here today. On the morning of the 19th of May, Cornet Thompson was brought into Burford Churchyard to the place of execution. Death was a great terror to him, as unto most. Some say he had hopes of a pardon and therefore delivered something reflecting upon the legality of his engagement and the just hand of God upon him. But if he had, they failed him. Corporal Perkins was the next. The place of death and the sight of his executioners was so far from altering his countenance or daunting his spirit that he seemed to smile upon both and accounted a great mercy that he was to die for this quarrel. And casting his eyes up to his father and afterwards to his fellow prisoners, who stood upon the church leads to see the executions, set his back against the wall and bid the executioners shoot. After him, Mr. John Church was brought to the stake. He was as much supported by God in his great agony as the latter. For after he had pulled off his doublet, he stretched out his arms and bid the soldiers do their duties, looking them in the face till they gave fire upon him, without the least kind of fear or terror. Thus was death the end of his present joy and beginning of his eternal future felicity. After these three, Cornet Den was brought to the place of execution, bringing his winding sheet with him. He expressed himself with much remorse of conscience for being an occasion to lead others into this way of mutiny and disobedience. But immediately before the act of execution, the general sent him a pardon, and he was sensible of mercy. You have seen the justice of the Lord, and you have seen his mercy. But his mercy is not exhausted, it is boundless like the sea. You are all pardoned of your great offences. There will be no more shootings. In due time, you may re-enlist or go to your homes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Cornet Den will preach to us the word of God in the new light which has been granted unto him in his seeking of the Lord. Dear brothers, I stand here full of shame to see you, knowing the awful nature of our crimes and by how much I was the author of them. Judas. The voice of the Lord was loud in my ear. I heard him. Judas. He spoke to me, and I rejoiced mightily that one so loved. Judas Den. Of such a mean understanding as I am, should be the vessel of his truth. 
The English Revolution ended here, on the morning of May the 19th, 1649, in Burford Church. The soldiers' democracy was over, and the dictatorship of the saints had begun. The three men who died are not remembered by the English people for whom they sacrificed their lives. They're buried in unmarked graves, and in the church itself, no plaque or tablet records their martyrdom. Of the other actors in this drama, Cornet Den's repentance went so far as the writing of a pamphlet to discredit his former comrades, and Major White got his lieutenant colonelship, but was drowned at sea five years later. Miles Syndicum made good his escape and lived to plot Cromwell's assassination, but he failed in his attempt and poisoned himself in the tower on the night before his execution. Fairfax retired into the literary seclusion that suited him better than politics, and the Restoration in 1660 claimed the lives of Harrison, Oakey and Scroop, executed at Charing Cross in revenge for the beheaded king. Cromwell was two years dead by then, but that didn't stop the exultant royalists exhibiting his remnants at Tyburn. Hewson alone escaped and died in exile. And the people? They lost, as usual. Their bid for power and self-respect had been crushed, and they returned to their life of near slavery. But something had happened here. A turning point in human affairs had been reached. The common soldiers of Cromwell's army had taught us what the word freedom might mean. We thought we had killed him. Such was our rejoicing in our love of God. We thought that we, his children, had laid him low. Opened the gates of hell. And liberated the poor condemned souls who grind and sweat there. And brought all up into the light of his love. We were not the first to be deceived, brothers. We will not be the last. The old enemy of mankind can fabricate these loving thoughts in our minds just as easily as he can bind us in our habitual wickedness. He has many snares for us. And if our feet should avoid the first, there is the second and the third to destroy us. And it was with his most fearful and hell-bred weapon, pride, that he brought us down and reduced us to this condition, poor prisoned wretches, thankful only for the great and loving